My eyes under the cooking pot. My mask in the corner of the room, hanging over my grimoire and skinning knife. And as I sit comfortably, relaxing into my daily meditative exercise, thumbing through my rosary of gewgaws, each bead, each stone, each bone is part of the jigsaw that makes up the weave. Look at the things we've done. Look at the things we've achieved. Look at where we started. The first piece to the rosary is a patch of crackled leather peeled back and pierced in its side. I was a young boy once. I lived in a quiet village where the sea met the meadows. It was tranquil. My mother and father were always good to me and my childhood was entertaining at best. However, being albino led to some complications with youngsters. You see, I was always picked on for the way I looked. My chalky skin and cloudy eyes made me a laughing stock to even the mothers and the fathers. Most of my younger days spent in the woods with my mother or down by their rock pools with my father was due to me being sheltered. By the age of 10, my father took me under his wing as a skinner and herbalist selling sea lion pelts to the local furriers who taught me rudimentary tanning. Skinning creatures came natural to me and I wasn't squeamish. However, through experience, I found it easier if the creature was dead rather than alive. But when I turned 15, I met Weave and my journey as one took a swift end. You see, Verano, the nation that my village dwelled in, declared all towns and villages to swear fealty to its king or to be declared an enemy of the kingdom. Amongst the elders of my village, their agreement was not to bow but to give offerings of peace and to work in union with one another. However, Verano lived up to their promise, and they came for us. The king wanted all stones turned, every man, every woman, every child. When I heard the screams of my mother and father, I hid in the basement of the barn house, rushing to put the shutters on latch. As I turned, a man was down with me. Old Bartholomew, his name was. <laughs> basket maker and one of the elders. He was speechless, clawing at my face to be quiet. Shh. You know I can still hear the screams. I can remember when they stopped. That memory sticks with me the most. They started to set fire to the buildings, all of them. We stayed pressed against the far southern wall and prayed to every god of every pantheon to protect us on that day. However, the embers roared, engulfing the roof and collapsing most of it around us. However, we were lucky. Maybe that prayer was answered. The debris covered the door and around us like a mesh of tangled wood and brick. A prison. Maybe not so lucky. Days passed with no hope or help. We lived off the water that trickled down the rain catcher into a bucket from the wreckage, however we were soon to have issues. We both had not eaten for days. I failed to get us food. I looked everywhere. But I didn't. He was too weak to go on. He would have slowed us down. We'd have been found and killed. I provided us with the necessary action. <laughs> Pity. He was a nice man. A few days later, I managed to make it out of the debris after days digging and breaking my way out. We broke out, remember? My thumbs now caressing the leather scrap and I thumb past a few other memories until I come across a black gem with a skull etched into it. My eyes looking at the gem as it almost stares back. Do you remember him? 
No idea. Life wasn't that hard after I left the village. I managed to survive peacefully off the land and move to a warmer climate. Nine years passed. Nine years of peace with myself and the land. No one to bother me. Bountiful food stuff to forage and hunt. Bliss. Until a full moon during one summer solstice. It was an ignominious start. Coughed into the dark. A first breath of thin, musty, footed air pulled deep into the lungs, expanding for the first time to power a new purpose. Eyes almost grimed shut with sweat and dirt and a morbid lack of focus. A filthy genesis for us then, one brood in a body too weak to help itself. Filthy, tired eyes looked at me from wilting, scared face. The only other company in the subterranean gloom, unsure, aware of a change in resolve, but not sure of the outcome. Outcome was determined swiftly and brutally, and then in the pleasure filled acquiescence of what happened there in that pit. A need to take a memento blossomed, something to remind us of the events, something to reflect upon and ponder. The choice was easy. His earlobe had this stone, a glorious and fitting tribute from that sack of meat and hair to both us and to the gods who had abandoned us and left us incapable of escape and starving. The laughter always was a signifier, a welcome and a farewell, an ebbing, a flowing away, like the tide as I sink back into our whirling thoughts, the immediate requirement to do the unthinkable for a while, but only for a while. A long period of happy freedom driven by a need for clarity and purpose that resulted in new steps forward, a treasure discovered and embraced. It was a gloomy day when I arrived, deep in the mangroves. Somewhere new and different, I realised as I wiped a tear from mirth moistened eyes and looked down at the red ruin at my feet. Probably a woman, probably a child. From the size but the features and shabby clothing all merged into a monochromatic blot, apart from the blood, obviously, as did most things out here near the swamp. It's the mud, you see. I stepped over the mess and made my way to what appeared to be a hovel, built in the bowl of a willow tree, very wide and festooned with creepers, promising as a diversion. A small, poorly made door creeped into a warm interior, the gloom inside broken by dim reed candles revealing a table, a half-finished meal and a black book. As I ate the leftovers of the breakfast with a small spoon, I thumbed idly through it. I was there as the daylight faded and I lit the bullseye lantern from our belt. Better to reveal the fascinating text and intriguing diagrams, I was still there through two lantern refills, and the grey light of the morning prodded invasive tendrils through the still open door. A necromancy. I had some small parts left outside to make a tentative start and splayed out some amateurish beginnings and beginning between what I ate and what I read managed to channel through purple energy to create two small bolts that withered the inside of the willow tree quite remarkably. I laughed with glee, clapping my reddish brown stained hands as I felt the ebbing begin. The willow house was not always quiet, a place of gore filled study and skin flavoured discovery we wanted it to be. We think word must have got out through the fairies, probably, that I must be hoarding gold in here. <laughs> Chance would be a thing. Any gold we got, I spend on components, some from the furthering and the reanimation, purple blossoming of reanimation, and some obviously to explore the inner self for hours. 
sat in our permanently wet circle of creative juices allowing the astral to flow into the prime and begin utterly unaware. They'd already got close enough to get past the skin-free beaver families that dangle as both warning us and watchdogs. <laughs> Watch beaver zombies. <laughs> when we realised our sanctum sectorum was about to be violated, desecrated and more probably robbed. Jumping to our feet with the drying coagulations dangling from our rear, I grabbed the skinning knife and a handful of the teeny scorpion tails that I had kept and dried for their hallucinogenic properties and clambered into the rafters. This certainly was exciting. I wasn't sure that we weren't still enjoying one of the travels of discovery. Brought on by the tails, but no, beneath me into the room came a small man, his face covered with a cloth over his mouth and nose and leather wrappings on his feet. The smell of the dank swamp came with him. He started poring over the various papers and documents on the table and didn't notice as I started dropping the tiny tails into his hair. He scratched at what he thought was a spider and brought bloody fingers away. Now the venom is strong, and unless you abuse it regularly, an X-shaped cross. Our interloper found himself nailed upside down to was testament to his admirable sobriety, rather ironic that this one's saving his grace to his otherwise sullied character was the thing that allowed him to become part of our greatest experiment yet. It wasn't a huge success if we're honest. But the eviscerated, faceless zombulet wandered away to create all manner of agonising mayhem. But it was enough of a success to be remembered, and the tanning of the face was some of our finest work. Entrail leather and scapular bone buckles attached at the ears, exaggerated stitches around the edges, a beetroot dyed heart leather mouth gashed in above the skin. Very dapper, something to admire in the shiny mirror, like surface of the skinning knives and laugh and laugh at the ebbing melding that heralds the quiet times again. It was my mask. You remember my mask. <laughs>